Hello, my name is Fielden Allison. And I'm Janet Allison. We've lived in Africa since 1972, and we've been married to each other since 1969. God blessed us with five children whom we raised here in Africa. My master's degree is in the Bible and related studies. Janet's master's degree is in marriage and family counseling. Our marriage ministry to families in Africa began in 1984, and we've written four books which are concerned with family issues. We have a big interest in helping families learn how to solve problems and have happy homes. This series of conversations is designed to help you answer your questions about the home and marriage. Janet, what is the question we're discussing today? Fielden, we want to discuss what it means for a wife to be in subjection to her husband. A few years ago in Africa, women were not educated and were expected to do only as they were told by their husbands. Wives were not given a chance to even have a deep conversation with their husbands or to discuss the decisions that he made in their home. But times have changed. Most young girls now go to school and learn new ways of living. With their new knowledge and understanding, they have become leaders in schools, communities, and in government. So the question is, what does it mean for a wife to be in subjection to her husband? How do these new teachings that have empowered women apply to the home today? Should wives today continue in the same way that their mothers and grandmothers did? Or should the wife have more freedom to help guide and lead in the home? If a wife is in subjection to her husband, how should she act to show that she is under his authority? Yeah, you know, times have changed. We cannot always answer questions by what society thinks or wants. We must think about what cultures have practiced and taught us and also learn what God wants. By doing that, we're more likely to get good answers to our questions. What is really involved here is that each of us must be willing to learn and have a humility in our hearts so that we can accept good advice. Well, how did God design the family? What relationship does God want between a husband and his wife? Sometimes we permit our wants or our feelings to get in the way so that we cannot clearly see what God wants in our lives or what is right for us to do. If we are truly seeking an answer to the question, what does it mean for a wife to be in subjection to her husband, then we will take time to study this question and then apply our answers to our own lives and our own homes. The first book of the Old Testament, which is called Genesis, or the Beginnings, says that in the beginning God created the world and everything in it by His great power. God knew how things should be organized in the world and in the home. The last thing He created was man, who was called Adam. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, says, Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He was made out of the dust of the ground. That's Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. We're told that all the animals had mates, but the man Adam was alone. God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. I'll make a helper for him, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. God caused Adam to sleep and took one of his rib bones and made the helper for Adam. That helper was a woman, Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 to 24, we read, And God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. Janet, I want to read 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, and honor them because they are weaker and they are heirs together with you of the grace of life. 
What did Peter mean when he said, the husband should honor his wife because she is weaker and that she is also an heir of the grace of life? What that simply means is that a man should not look down on his wife because she is smaller than he is. That's right. But the husband should give her honor because to God, she is just as valuable as the man is. Research has shown that women are just as intelligent as men are. A woman has physical and emotional needs just like her husband. She can talk and reason about important things that need to be done. When God made the woman, she was not taken from his foot so that she would feel like she was being stepped on. Also, she was not taken from a bone in Adam's head so that she would not think that she was to rule over him. But Eve was taken from Adam's side, his rib, to show that the husband and wife were to respect one another. They were made equal. God did not make Adam to be better than his wife. Not one human is better than another in our world. One tribe of people is not better than another tribe. Men are not better than women. We were all created by God in his likeness with a soul and the ability to choose right or wrong. All of us can see that although there are many things that men and women have in common, their physical makeup, their speech, their reasoning powers, we also see that men and women are different in some ways. For example, Women are more emotional than men are. Yeah, I've seen that, yeah. They cry more easily. They have more empathy for children. Men usually have bigger and stronger bodies than women do. Men have more hair on their bodies than women do. Their voices are deeper. Their sexual organs are different. Women's bodies are created to be able to give birth to children and to feed them. You forgot that women are more beautiful than men, too. Uh, Oh, yes. It is really amazing that God created men and women like he did. They're different in many ways, and yet God made them to live together, to work together, to love each other. God made the husband to be exactly what the wife needed and the wife to be exactly what the husband needed. God is great. The husband and wife are not greater than each other, but he made them to live together and to work together and to make a family. Each one complements the other one. It takes both a husband and a wife to make a home. God made them to work side by side. So, Filden, if the husband and wife are equal in value before God, and both are made in the image of God, then does a wife also have to be under her husband or in subjection to him? Well, just because God made a husband and a wife equal does not mean that he did not design roles for each one of them to live. Two things can be made and have equal value and and yet have distinct roles. For example, which is more important, the arm or the hand? Each is dependent on the other one. An arm by itself cannot hold things or do work, or a hand by itself has no use. Each one has a very important role to play in doing a job. Now, each part might think it is the most important, but unless they each do their own roles, nothing can be done. Janet, do you think the husband is greater than his wife? No way. In marriage, the husband does not have greater value than the wife. He's not better or worth more than his wife. He was not created with more wisdom or spiritual strength than his wife. But God did give the husband a different role to play in the family. God also gave the wife a special role in the family. It was God's decision to do that. Adam did not design the different roles for himself and his wife. Well, let us look at what the Bible says about the different roles that God gave a husband and wife. Maybe this will help us answer the question about a wife's subjection to her husband. First, we'll look once again to the beginning of the world when God first created people. After God had made Adam and Eve and given them a beautiful life and a garden to live in, they failed to obey God. They ate the fruit of the tree which God told them not to eat. Because of their sin, God made them to leave the beautiful garden. 
God told Eve that her husband would rule over her. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, To the woman, he said, Your desire shall be for your husband, and he will rule over you. The Apostle Paul wrote more about that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, he said, for Adam was formed first and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. He clearly stated that a woman should not teach or have authority over a man. He continued by saying that the reason why that is true is that God made man first and then the woman. He also said that in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, that it was Eve who sinned first. God had a reason and a purpose for how he organized things. We have to believe that it was God's design that a man would be the head over his wife or that woman should be in subjection to her husband. Mm -hmm. You know, every institution that we have must have a person who leads that institution or who is the head of it. A school has a head teacher. A business has a CEO or chief executive officer. A country has a president or a prime minister. There has to be someone who is at the top to oversee and lead that institution. When God designed the church, he gave it a head. Again, Paul, writing in Colossians chapter 1, 13 through 18, said that God saves us through his Son, Jesus Christ. He said that it was Jesus who made the world and everything in it. In verse 18, Paul said, He, speaking about Christ, is the head of the body, which is the church. The church of God is the institution of God, has a head, who is Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote the Ephesian church, he had more to say about Christ being the head of the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23, all the way to verse 33, we read about uh, what Paul says about Christ in the church. Paul is trying to help the church understand that their head is Christ, not a physical man in the church. He proves that Christ is the head of the church by using the home as an example. In verse 23, he said, For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ also is the head of the church. Paul's understanding about how God had arranged the family was that from the beginning, the husband was to be the head of his wife and of his family. Yes, Fielden. When the Bible says that the husband is the head of his wife, he means exactly that. An animal cannot have two heads. A school or a business or a country cannot have two heads. The church cannot have two heads. In the same way, a home cannot have two heads. God has placed the husband as the head of the family. We trust God that he knew exactly what he was doing. With what we have learned, the husband's role in the family is to be the head. The wife's role is to honor her husband by being in subjection to him. Just as Christ is the head of the church, and all of us Christians are in subjection to him. In the same way, wives must be in subjection to their husbands. But I'm still a little confused, Fielden. What does it mean exactly to be in subjection? Does it mean that the wife does not have a voice in the family's affairs? Does it mean that she must never question her husband's decisions or give her views about how things should be done? That is a good question. We talked about being under our head, Jesus Christ. Jesus has given us his teaching. When I am in submission to Christ, I listen very carefully to what he teaches, and I follow his teaching. Because I love Jesus, I listen to him, and I want to do what he tells me because I trust him. Jesus prayed to his Father and he wants us to pray also. He wants to hear about our stresses. He's concerned about our hurts. Even when we complain to him, he knows that we are respecting him enough to share our very lives with him. I think that applies directly to the relationship between a husband and his wife. You know, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, when God said it was not good for a man to be alone, he said, I will make a helper. That word helper 
implies that the woman was not just to sit idly, but she was to actively help her husband. All of us need help in our lives. Husbands need help. God's plan was to provide someone for the man who would really help him. Of course, a worthy wife works hard at home doing so many different things. She helps her husband by cooking for him, washing his clothes, providing sexual fulfillment, bearing children. She also helps him when he is discouraged or stressed by talking to him and helping him to see the good things in his life. God has blessed wives with brains and understanding. A helping wife suggests ways that can strengthen her husband's decisions about the home, the animals, the finances, and even their spiritual lives. You know, I found that to be so true in my very own home. Janet, you've been a big help to me in so many ways. When I have shared with you about things that I think we need to do, you've given me a new way of looking at those things. Together, we make a much wiser decision. Two heads are better than one, they say. I'm thankful that God gave you to me to help me. Let's face it, I need help. Uh, The trouble with men is that they think they know everything and they don't need help. No man can stand alone. Again, God knew exactly what he was doing when he made a woman to help her man. We men need to be thankful for God's help in knowing what we need and then providing it for us. Janet, from your own perspective, as a woman and a wife, how can a wife be in subjection to her husband and yet at the same time be his helper? The Bible teaches that a wife should honor her husband. She honors him by always being faithful to him. She honors him by not being demanding or bossy over him. A helping wife tells her husband how much she appreciates his hard work and his good qualities. She tries to build him up with encouraging words and actions. A helping wife never talks about her husband's faults in front of other people, not even her own children. When she acts that way, then he is happy to come home, and he is even willing to listen to her when she discusses things with him. Her husband learns that his wife is a good person and is trying to help him. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 2, we are told about a man and his wife, Aquila and Priscilla, who were Christians living in the city of Corinth. In verse 26, we are told that Priscilla helped her husband by welcoming a young evangelist named Apollos into their home and by teaching from God's Word more accurately. If we take this scripture in context with the other scriptures that we have read about, a woman being in subjection to her husband, then we must conclude that Priscilla was in subjection to her husband Aquila, but she helped him in the home to minister to others. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 19, we learn that Aquila and Priscilla hosted a church in their home. Obviously, Priscilla was not just quiet, never speaking to her husband. Rather, she helped him do things in their home. She was in subjection to him, but also a partner with him and helping him. Even in the Old Testament, in the story about Abraham and his wife Sarah, We learn that Sarah was in subjection to her husband, but she also gave him suggestions and advice about home affairs. The Apostle Peter said Sarah called Abraham her Lord in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. But in Genesis chapter 21, she advised Abraham to cast out Hagar and her child Ishmael. Abraham listened to the advice of his wife. God even told Abraham to heed the advice of his wife. God is great. Our work is to listen to him about how he organized the home and follow his teaching. I hope that this study has blessed your life. If you have more questions or comments, you can write to us at aimfradio at gmail.com. Our ministry is called the African Institute of Marriage and Family. We value your thoughts and your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.